Uh, e, all I can think of is Evergreen, Evergreen Road. Yeah, excellent. And if you take the Evergreen Road to its end, right by the Evergreen Hotel, you're not far from an extraordinary experimental group of 19th century houses known as Evergreen Hamlet. Franklin Toker, author and professor of art history at Pitt, knows the history of this place. Evergreen was founded by 16 families as a refuge. It's exactly the middle of the 19th century, uh, 1851. Uh, these were all striving middle-class families. And amazingly, the prime industry was the oil industry. There was Samuel Keir and Wade Hampton and a bunch of people growing rich in Pittsburgh's early ascendancy in the oil industry. There was a scafe. Uh, there were some lawyers, and the rest were iron masters, basically. Since Pittsburgh industrialized so early, got so dirty, smoky, smelly, it had to be one of the first places in the United States that escaped industrialization. So this is truly the first suburb in the United States. Lots of cities could make that claim, but if you say something that is not rural and not urban, but where the families are connected to the main town, this is the first suburb in the United States. And uh, there's one in uh, New Jersey, uh, 1852. This one's 1851, so there we go. The families of the Evergreen Hamlet actually put together a charter, a constitution, a written document about their plans for this early experiment in environmental planning. 17 lots were laid out and uh, one for the schoolhouse, the rest for the families. They had about an acre each, but it was 85 acres total, so the rest was in common. The Evergreen experiment wasn't exactly successful. Only five or six buildings were ever built, four of which remain. Then in 1866, they disbanded. The communal aspiration clearly never happened, but it continued to be a a grouping of private houses. And uh, it takes us straight back to the middle of the 19th century when Pittsburgh needed to escape the Industrial Revolution more than any other city. But it's a big part of a certain kind of American ethos, respecting the land, building with the land instead of uh, harming it, let's say. And uh, this is 1851 in Pittsburgh. Living with nature was important for at least a very small number of people who could afford it in the middle of the 19th century. E is looking good right now as Evergreen Hamlet. Tells us so much about mid-Victorian Pittsburgh. F, I think, would be its straight descendant, which is Falling Water, Frank Lloyd Wright's masterpiece, because Falling Water is Pittsburgh, just a little detached. Well, frankly, Falling Water would be fine. But so would Fifth and Forbes, the downtown area that so many people want to help. There's the neighborhood of Friendship. F could be for the Frick Fine Arts Building. It's two fish fries in a boat for here. But if it's a Friday, F might as well be for fish sandwiches. A lot of people say they have the, the best uh, fish sandwich in Pittsburgh, but I'm not sure which place it is, really. The Strip, there's a lot of good places for fish. And it's known for seafood with woolies and banquets and... A lot of bragging rights. Every, every uh, neighborhood usually has a place and you'll see a sign, best fish sandwich in Pittsburgh. May or may not be true, but it's a lot of fun. Marlene Parrish is a food writer and columnist for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And she sampled sandwiches several places, like at Needs Hotel in Lawrenceville, where we talked to some of the regulars. It's a family affair here, and, and the fish sandwiches are served with a lot of love. They're, they're really good. I've enjoyed them ever since I've been coming here. It's a staple, just like the Pirates and the Steelers. A good fish sandwich and a beer. Here it needs, like plenty of places, it's just fish. Who knows what kind? Fresh caught. Fresh caught. Fresh caught. Flown in from Maine. <laughs> 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 Who knows why? Pittsburghers just love fish sandwiches. We have a very heavy Catholic population here, and years ago, there was no meat 
on Fridays, and everybody ate fish of any kind. I still don't eat fish on Friday, or I still don't eat meat on Friday. <laughs> I mean, I'm Catholic, but I don't know if that's the reason. I mean, I just, I mean, I don't, like for dinner, I won't necessarily eat fish for dinner, but for lunch, I like to come here and get a fish sandwich. Here is the Oyster House downtown in Market Square. Fridays is usually fish and fries. That's just a family tradition. In fact, it's a joke at work. A lot of the people there say, John, where'd you go for lunch today on Friday? Because they know I always come here. It's like a habit. We tried a lot of fish sandwiches. This is the best. It's, it's fish. I, I, I trust it's not from any of our rivers, it's, but it tastes fine. Everybody comes here. That's all they need to see is Oyster House, and that's it. Downtown. <laughs> In the strip, Marlene took us to Roland's. The fish sandwich that I want to have has twice as much fish hanging off this little bun. This is what I like about Roland's. We don't have anything like this in Nebraska. Now that's a fish sandwich and a half. Order in. We wiggled our way into the kitchen. Beer better fish split. Where the fish is floured and dipped and fried. Look at this. Can you hear it? That's crisp. Here it comes. I'm going to break this. Look at that. That's juicy and fresh. It is a beer batter, by the way. It's great. It's big. The fact is, Pittsburgh people who fancy fish sandwiches on Fridays are never going to agree about which one is really best. If the filet is fresh and in front of you, that's fabulous. If they're deep fried, what could be bad? You can get them broiled, but what kind of a wuss would do that? You know? <laughs> you know, this was just a clip. To get a DVD copy of this entire program or others like it, please call 1-800-274-1307 or visit wqed.org and click on Shop WQED.